So before we start, I will just like to say this, and that is that I do not like doing price predictions. I feel like it gives people a uh, false sense of security, especially when we talk about what the price could potentially be, and people kind of hang their hat on it and say, well, this is what it has to be because somebody said it. Now, I think moving forward, a lot of us realize how ridiculous that is, but just take this with a grain of salt because some of these price predictions are seriously crazy outlandish, but some are quite reasonable. And we're gonna go over to what I would consider reasonable and why the outlandish ones could potentially make it, but there's a lot of things to actually go through. So, but the first thing, as we go through the markets, especially in these bearish times, it seems like nothing ever is going to go our way. Things just chop sideways, things bleed off, and, and we have a problem with that. And it, it feels like uh, nothing's going to, to rise. And inversely, when we are into a bullish market, we think the same thing. Well, things will never go down. It's going to be awesome forever, and it's just going to keep going up, and that's pretty much it. And we can see this in the fear and greed index. And you can tell, like, once we get into, like, extreme fear, as the price starts to, to drop off the planet, and you can just see that people are like, it'll never go up. And then it goes up and people get a little bit hopeful, a little bit spirited. And then it gets to this green point where, you know, the score is like uh, extreme, extreme greed. And people are like, it's never going down. And then it does that. So right now we are, as this is saying, and looking at Bitcoin, we are neutral. I think it's a good time to give a little perspective. And in reality, uh, for our market, really what it is, if we take a look at the trend line, is that this is the fair market value on, on, on the, red, the red horizon, the red axis. And we need to see that for the majority of the time, for the total crypto market, we are either above or below the fair market value. It's not very stable. And we see things that just go up and go crazy. And we go below that. But we're never really at this, this red point for a fair market value. And that's just the way it is. So when we take a look at these, these prices, just again, take things with a grain of salt. And this was the Bitcoin price prediction. This is from uh, Crypto Crunch app. You can follow them. Uh, I think they have a, an account on Twitter, but this is on Instagram. I don't really use Instagram that much. But these are the price predictions they have uh, accumulated across the board. And there's some that are just, I think, quite honestly ridiculous. I mean, a million dollars in 2024 for Kathy Wood. Uh, all right. Mike Novogratz, half a million. Tim Draper has been saying 250,000 forever. He said this is going to happen last year. And he's like, well, maybe one more year. And then we got Tom Lee, who was up like a perma bull. Uh, and I remember him all the way back when I first got in 2017. And he was saying that Bitcoin is going to go into a million, something crazy like that. And then we have the things that are a little bit more somewhat realistic. Robert Kiyosaki, Adam Back, uh, all both at 100K. And then the ones that I think are the most reasonable are the lower parts. Jamie Dimon and JP Morgan and Arthur Hayes at 45 and 70K respectively. So how can we quantify that? How can we take a look at it and see, well, is there anywhere that they could be, you know, in the ballpark? Well, it's quite easy. if We take a look a little bit at the past. And first of all, just so you know, the Bitcoin halving is a little over 200 days away. And time moves fast. And before you know it, this is going to be less than 100 days. And it's going to be less than 30 days. Before you know it, the Bitcoin halving will actually be here. The date itself is roughly April 17th, 2024. So I know we think that, you know, things are really, you know, far away, but they're actually quite not. So what I want to do is I want to take a look at, again, four-year cycles, take a look back. And I want to see, we're going to take a look at the last two cycles. We're going to take a look at the price of the halving during those years and the halvings happened in 2016, happened in 2020. Well, actually, that happened in 2012 as well. But 2016, 2020, and of course, then in 2024. And we're going to take that and we're going to see what the prices of the halving years were as compared to the previous cycle's all-time high. So for 2016, we're going to take a look at 2013. And for 2020, we're going to take a look at 2017. And that's where we can kind of take a look at where things are going. So... First things first, the last or two cycles ago, the all time high, look at these prices, first of all. Can you imagine this? Imagine this. In 2013, the price of Bitcoin was 100 bucks, 111, $106, somewhere around there. This was during the all time high year. It went from 110X 
just a little bit over $1,000. So, okay, we have $1,000. That was the last or the two cycles previously in 2013 for the all-time high. Well, how did the, the having year do? Well, in all honesty, it was not a bad year. In 2016, we were rough at the very beginning. We're at $430, $430. So think of it this way. You had an all-time high of the last cycle around 1000 So it was a little bit less than half. We'll say roughly 40%, right? $430, somewhere around there. And from there, to go all the way up, it hit roughly the all-time high again, roughly $1,000. $966, but uh, you know, just splitting here is $971. And that was the all-time high for the halving in 2016. Previous cycle, it was roughly 1000 and what's interesting to me is that roughly 40% of what it was for the all-time high. Now let's move forward. Here we are in 2017. The all-time high for that was 20,000. And look at this. We started with $1,000 roughly right after the 2016. We hit the all-time high or for the previous one in 2013 and 20x. Not a bad not a bad year. Not a bad year to go into things. And if we take a look here in 2020, again, I find it interesting because roughly a little bit more than half, we'll say, 40%, 35%, somewhere around there. Because the previous all-time high was roughly 20,000. Now we're looking at 7,000. So it was a little bit less than half. 35%, 40%, somewhere around there. Correct me in the comments for the, for the math I'm a little bit off, I'm sure. What we can see here for 2020, we went from 7,000, and this is the halving year, all the way up to really 150% of what we were previously. So in 2017, we had 20,000. The halving year for the next cycle, $28,000. So when we take a look at it and we see, well, where can we potentially go for the next one? Because in 2024, is it within the realm of possibility that we could actually go from the all-time high up? So what was the all-time high last cycle? Last cycle, the all-time high, eh, that's not right. That's right. Roughly $67,000. $67,000, pretty good year, I would say, I would say. So if we can take a look at the last two cycles, again, in 2016, it hit its all-time high at the end of the year from the previous cycle, 1,000. If we come over here, we actually went one and a half times, 28,000. So in 2024, if we think about it, in 2024, to, for the last two cycles, I mean, Jamie Dimon and JP Morgan, I could potentially be undershooting. But again, these are all price predictions and nobody knows. No one's got a crystal ball. It's ridiculous to even think of it. But if we take a look at the last two cycles, Arthur Hayes is pretty much could be on point with Adam Back and Robert Kiyosaki. Because remember, one and a half times. So it's either going to be, if I had to put, if I had to be a gambler, which I kind of am because I'm in crypto, I would say Arthur Hayes is pretty good on for 70,000, taking a look at 2016 and 2020, which was the previous all time high, which is what we were at before 67, 68,000, somewhere around there, so 70,000. Then, of course, the last one, it was one and a half times. So 70, one and a half, use some quick math. That's roughly 100 and 100K. And it sounds ridiculous. When I first took a look at this, I'm like, that, first of all, like Robert Kiyosaki, I loved his books and things like that. That's, he's one of the reasons why I got into uh, real estate. But when I saw this 100K with Adam back, I was like, there's no way. There's no way that it could actually hit that in 2024. Because why? Because we're on this trajectory right now where everything's kind of chopping sideways and it's boring. We just don't believe anything. Whereas opposed to, you know, as things go up. So I can see how these four 
gentleman could potentially be right. Now, having said all that, remember this. Uh, when I started to do these price predictions beforehand in 2020, I thought it was a lock that Bitcoin get to 100K, and it didn't. Didn't even get near that. 67,000 was it. So take this with a grain of salt. However, if we take a look at some of the big players, Tom, Lee, Tim, and Mike, and Kathy, where do they get these things? Where could this actually actually happen? Well, if you think about it, our market cap is 1.1 trillion. I think we topped out around 3.3 trillion. And if we just have some kind of allocation of other funds, uh, we could do pretty well. It could go up to 5 trillion, 6 trillion, 7 trillion. This, this little square right here is worth 100 billion. Here's Sam Bankman Fried, March 22, he's worth 26 billion today. Actually, he's worth zero because he's in prison. So this is actually from 2022. Actually, that's not true. Even though he's in prison, he's still got a bunch of our money, right? Well, I didn't use FTX, but it was one of the ones I actually avoided. And then back in, back in the day, in 2022, this was in uh, November, 28, 2022. Crypto is worth $760 billion. Currency here, $8 trillion. Gold, $12 trillion. Maybe if we could just, I don't know, shave off like a uh, half a trillion there or so, as people like, they think to themselves, maybe I should diversify. Central bank balance sheets, 28 trillion. S&P 500, which I think people get disillusioned now with S&P 500 because, I mean, the annual returns between eight and 10%, maybe that 36 trillion that is sloshing around in stocks, maybe people go, you know what? Just because, uh, you know, Black Rocks and the institutions are coming in and Fidelity and people like that, maybe we should allocate a little bit more to the crypto market. Global money supply, 49 trillion. Stock markets, 280 trillion. And global debt, 300 trillion. Global real estate, which is collapsing in uh, China right now, $326 trillion. Jeez. Household wealth, 463 trillion. Again, that's a lot of money. So all these things on derivatives, 600 trillion, something like that. So all this money right here, if it could actually find its way into Bitcoin and the greater crypto market, I think we do quite well. Also on top of that, pension funds. I don't know if you've seen this. I don't think I've ever showed this to you guys. But I mean, if we had a bunch of, I mean, pension funds, they have problems all the time, whether that be solvent or not. So maybe if they take some of that and invest into something that like BlackRock says, hey, this is not a bad idea. As far as a spot ETF, if that ever gets approved, we're going to see that, like in America, not just America, here we are for, I mean, Japan, the government pension investment fund of Japan is 1.7 trillion. You gotta be kidding me. It's a lot. Calpers, thrift savings plan, 774, that's, all, that's over 1.2 trillion as well. Calstra is 313 billion. Norway, 1.4 trillion, maybe, I mean, all these ones. Just imagine all these, all of this. This is over $20 trillion. I think it's over $30 trillion, matter of fact. If we take something like this and they allocate a little bit to crypto and digital assets, especially the big ones, I think it'd actually quite, do quite well. And then lastly, I know people will say, well, this is a lot of hope, and this is kind of ridiculous. And it might be, you know, but at some point we have to kind of, broaden our focus to see what's really going on out there and just to see what could potentially be. Does this mean that this is going to happen or we're not going to see some major dips coming up? No. And we actually talked about this yesterday. And it was actually a very bullish, it was a very, it wasn't bullish, it was a very positive uh, video that I put out. And we took a look at if you right now are stressed out about your particular, if your dollar cost averaging or investing, I showed you like, here's a way to take the stress out of it. And we took a look at, again, historically, and we took a look at a lot of alts. Ethereum, Cardano, Doge, Doge Solana, Polkadot, Polygon, Chainlink, Near, everything you pretty much think of. I mean, the top 30 or so, 35. And just see like, you can do this, you can dynamic DCA, you can do lump sum, you can wait, you can sit on the sidelines. And there was a lot of data 
to show to take some stress out. So I highly encourage you to take a look at that and then move forward. Anyhow, that concludes it for that piece. Let me know what you think about that in the comment section. And then to, to speak about alts, there was a, a story that just came out, which talked about how uh, Ethereum is not is now inflationary and how awful it is. And you know, over the last 30 days, it's been pretty awful as far as inflationary. There's a website called ultrasound.money. And as Ethereum transitioned from proof of work to proof of stake over a year ago now, yeah, you can see that the, there actually is inflationary. But that was the title of the, of the story. It's about 30 days and it's inflationary and everything. But if we really rewind time and take a look at this, well, not an hour, that's kind of goofy. But the last day, the last day, last 24 hours, they've had an increase of 1,300 ETH. All right. The last seven days, man, 6,000 ETH. That's a lot. Wish I had some of that. The last 30 days, almost 14,000 increase. Inflationary for Ethereum. And we can see here, but underneath here, this little line here, it was deflationary for a bit, but let's keep going. The last year or so, 370 days. It was inflationary in the beginning, but we can see here that since February 2nd, it's been pretty massively deflationary as opposed to proof of work of what it was. And, you know, if we go way, way back, we can see that there's a little bit of deflationary aspects to it. But again, if you take a look at the story, just like for 30 days, you're like, well, it is pretty inflationary. So that's it. So on that one, and we can also, you can also simulate the proof of work, how bad it would be. Ooh, not too bad. So that would, I think Ethereum will do okay. And then lastly, just so everybody knows, uh, I get any questions about this, uh, Sweatcoin, which is one I've been talking about for over a year now. And the reason why is because I invested heavily into it and I'm super biased. I think we all know that's on this channel, right? So the launch was uh, actually extended uh, to October 17th. And just so everybody knows, uh, well, first of all, there's a link in the description. Uh, which talks about what Sweatcoin is and it's, uh, download it and things like that. I've been talking about this for about a year or so. And it's one of those, those projects that's been, it's been in Web2 for over seven years, I believe, 140 million downloads. I think it has over 20 million downloads in Web3 itself and NFT token and all that stuff. But when I was talking about it, it was a free app. I'll skip that version. It's a free app to actually use. And if you would have done this for a year, a uh, 1,000 steps would equal one sweat coin. Right now, one sweat coin is worth less than a penny, though. And I think it topped out at like seven cents, but it'll probably go up in the next bull run. But if you just would have downloaded the app and walked on it and done nothing, you would have a decent amount of sweat coins on there. Because right now in September, it went from 1,000 steps to 4,500, and then it's going to go to 5,500, and this is going to be deflationary. It's deflationary right now. So on top of that, they would give away a Tesla Model Y. And then the thing that I wanted to, to, to always bring up is this. I know we always look at, like, does number go up? If number goes up, it's awesome. If number goes down, it's awful. That's not the way that we should look at things. I mean, look at Pepe coin. Look at a lot of meme coins that are out there. <clears throat> they do absolutely nothing. But numbers went up and people thought it was awesome. It's not. I don't think so. Maybe I'm wrong. But really what we should take a look at is unique active wallets, the fees that are generated, who's using it in developers. And there's a website I like to use, DAP Radar. And you can see that some of these, like Kai Ching, we talked about this as far as uh, e-commerce and what they're using over there. If we scroll down, Sweat Economy is number 16. And as far as the balance of what it's got, actually got locked on, it's 22 million. Now, it may not be a lot for, for some people, but think of it this way. Pancake Swap is 58 million locked up. Second Live is an app or is a, is a game. Uh, Pancake Swap version 3, 270 million. So, I mean, for that, an unique active wallet's 38,000 in the last week or so, plus 12%. These are the things that we should be looking at as far as like, are people using it or not? So just so you know, because 
This is actually going to happen on 17 October. If you're in the United States, all those sweat coins that you have, you'll be able to transfer them over and uh, use within the app for real world value of uh, funds. So that is it for today. Actually, you know what? That's not it for today. Let me do this something like this. I got to show you something. All right. The app. Here's the Sweatcoin app. Because if you scroll down here, see right there, convert Sweatcoins to crypto? You got to you opt in if you're in America. Countdown has begun. Now, right, 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 next. Sweat for Sweatcoin. Opt in. And just put your email right there. Uh, Dan. I'll do that later. So I'll put that in. And then it'll just notify you so you can cover everything over. The thing I like about this is you actually use it. So look at all this stuff. Like, I don't know what you're using, but this stuff actually, well, where's one I wanted to get? Ah, the alpha brain. 10 sweat coins. That's not bad. I got 7,000. What else do I got? Was that a stone? I don't know what lingo pie is. Pixie mini power bank. A Bluetooth speaker. Ah, whatever. So that's it uh, for the app itself. And that's it for today. So look, if you like today's video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. I'm going to talk about it as time sensitive as usual. But that concludes uh, the news part.